All right, so just a quick reminder here, we're, we're talking about function notation. So if we've got the equation y equals 2x plus 3, you know, we can rewrite this using function notation. It means the same thing, right? f of x is just a fancy name for, for y. Okay, but, but we want to kind of think very carefully about what it means to, to be a function again. It's, you know, we talked about relations are just mappings, they're just rules that, that map an input value to an output value. Most of the time for us in an algebra class, it's going to be an equation of some kind. Right? We're going to input, say, an x value, and we're going to calculate a y value, which is the output. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. They could just be, could be just tables, or they could be a graph, could be lots of things. Uh, relation just is some kind of a connection between an input and an output. Remind me, this goes back to, you know, before break, so you've got to dig back a little bit. What makes a function? A function is a specific kind of relation. What does it take to be a function? What's it take to be a function? Yes, sir. For every input, there's only one output? Good. For every input, there's exactly one output. You can't have multiple outputs for an input, right? So that, that makes a function. <coughs> We can do things like, for example, we can represent the surface area S of a function, uh, S as a function of radius, and we've done a few things like this. So this is going to seem like overkill, but this is really inside our brains. This is really the process that we're going through. If you write a function that uses surface area to uh, a surface area formulate to generate the output values, you've really got two things going on. You've got Surface area is a function of radius, right? And, and we know that's true. If I've got a sphere, the radius of the sphere, we can get a sense that's going to predict the surface area. We know that there's a, uh, a specific rule that's going to map the, the input value to the output value. And if we combine those, we can just come up with a single function. You know, surface area as a function of radius is just 4 pi r squared. Okay, so we, we did something like that. So here's kind of a way to think about this. You can think about a function as, as sort of a machine that processes input values and spits out output values. So the domain we've been introduced to, right? The domain is the set of all the input values. You can sort of think of that as a, as a holding area for the raw materials you're going to feed the machine, right? Those are the inputs. The function machine is going to process those in some way. Usually it's going to be some equation. And then it's going to spit out values, it's going to output values into the range, which is just another holding area for the finished product, right? That's the output of the whole process, okay? So we want to be a little more specific with this. And this is, you know, like I say, this is not hard, but it's important that we understand these conventions. So domains and ranges can be written in, in three ways. There's three, I mean, you, there really are probably even more ways than that, but there's three ways that we use a lot. And of these three ways, Really, two of them we use a lot more than the other one. One of them is just using inequalities, right? So, for example, we could talk about the domain as being something like this. Now, how would we say that? We reviewed this at the beginning of the year, but be careful. How would we say that domain? X is greater than 2. And less than or equal to 6. Good. You start in the middle. And we know x is greater than some lower boundary of 2 and less than or equal to some upper boundary of 6, right? Good. So there's one way to say it. Another way to say it would be using what we call set builder notation or set notation. All that means is <clears throat> we're going to use the script brackets, which indicate a set, and we're going to identify what's the input variable, in this case an x, vertical line, that means x such that x is greater than 2 and less than or equal to 6. It's the same thing, essentially, isn't it? It's notice that we just, we're using the same inequality that we use if we just write this as a strict inequality, but it's just more formal. It's just saying, okay, we're declaring that x is the variable, and this is what we're doing with that variable in the domain. We won't really use that. That's just, it seems kind of overkill, right? It doesn't really give us any extra information. So we'll either use inequalities or we'll use interval notation. Give me a one to five on this. How familiar are you guys with interval notation? Is that something that, that you say, okay, I totally get that, or is that something that's you're just not sure how we got that answer? Yeah. 
five meaning totally, I totally remember this, or I remember going through this, or one meaning I don't know if I ever saw this before. Okay, or zero meaning you've absolutely never seen this before. That's fine. So that's okay. So so how does this work then? So interval notation. Notice that that the two lines up with the lower boundary and the six lines up with the upper boundary. So just think of this like a number line, right? The, the left boundary on the number line is what goes first, and the right boundary is what comes second. The nature of the symbol that encloses that just tells us, are we including that endpoint or not, right? Now, let's think about uh, what would happen if I were going to graph this interval. What would that look like? If I were, if I were graphing this inequality, right? We've got the x-axis. Let's say that's 2 and that's 6. How would I graph that inequality? What do you think? Who hasn't helped me out yet? Be brave, somebody. What's that going to look like? Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to get an open circle around the 2 because we're not including that. Closed circle on the 6. Right? Okay. So this is. This is a, what we call, uh, this is an open endpoint and a closed endpoint. We would call this a semi-closed interval or a semi-inclusive interval. We'll get to the vocabulary in a little bit in a second. But notice that the open circle corresponds to the rounded, you know, the parentheses instead of the bracket. The closed endpoint corresponds to the bracket. There's a simple way to remember that. It takes more, uh, it takes more ink to draw a closed circle. It takes more ink to draw a bracket than a rounded parentheses, right? Uh, so you can kind of correlate those two. Sorry. <laughs> so, so here are sort of our conventions then, right? So we'd say that the, the smallest number in the interval we always write first. So we're thinking in the same order as a, as the real line, but less to or lesser to greater. Uh, larger numbers are written second. Comma separates the two. Parentheses are used to signify an endpoint value that's included, okay, that, or that's not included. So that's called an exclusive uh, boundary. Brackets are used to indicate an endpoint that is included. So that's called inclusive. And then we could have something that's semi-inclusive, like what we had right here. Right, we're only including one of the two endpoints. Semi just means half, right? So it's halfway inclusive. Questions so far? Okay. So it's, it's not, you know, pretty simple rules. Let, let's look at all the possibilities here. You know, what would these look like? So if we're using interval notation, uh, if we want to say the expression x is greater than a, that's what it looks like. That's a little funny. Why the infinity? I, what does infinity really mean? I mean, a lot of times we talk about infinity. Yeah, it, we talk about it like it's a number. And in calculus, you know, we'll do that for convenience sake, but it's not, right? If we could do a whole class, and we could do, like, more than one year of a class just talking about it. It's a complicated subject. But here, it's pretty clear what it means. If we're, gra let's graph this thing, right? If we're going to graph on a number line, whoops. Oh, yes. So if we're graphing, if we're starting at A, we want all the values greater than A, doesn't that just look like open endpoint to the right? Okay, so if we're writing that using our, our criteria or our, our rules for interval notation, we've got to have the lower boundary on the left and the upper boundary on the right. But if the upper boundary is infinity, what's that telling us? There's, there is no upper boundary. Because infinity is a moving target. If you think you've gotten there, well, you're wrong. There's got infinitely far to go still. Yep. Okay, good question. Why? And, and that's a really common mistake that people make. So we want to deal with this right now. This absolutely cannot be a bracket. How come? How come? It's not set. You can never get there. Right? Infinity is not a target you can never get to. It just means increasing without boundary. Right? So it can't be, it would, it, it would be, you know, that would be just, wouldn't make any sense to have a square bracket there. It has to be a rounded bracket if you're including infinity. 
Okay, so then doesn't it make sense that if we're saying x is less than a, then now we have an upper boundary of a. So it's got to go on the right, but there is no lower boundary. If we were to draw this one, you know, graph this interval, there's our a, and we've got open endpoint to the left. Right, so there is no clear lower boundary, so it's got to be vanishingly large, right, or, or large, increasingly large in the negative direction. I said that backwards. So it'd be negative infinity without bound. But there is a clear upper limit. That's a. Uh, what's the difference if I say x is greater than or equal to a? Obviously, what's that doing? Right. Yeah, just just filling in that endpoint. Right. No big deal. So we just end up with something like this. Right. If x is less than or equal to a, we're just filling in the endpoint. It looks like that. Okay. Notice now all that does is it gives us a closed bracket, right, at at the a's because they are being included. More ink to draw the circle, more ink to draw the brackets, more points in the set. Exactly one more point in the set. Okay. Does that seem a little weird? So which of these, which of these sets is bigger, this guy or this guy? I guess I just answered it. Yes. That guy is. Is that weird though? Yes. Because how many points are in this set? How many are in this one? So how can infinity be this infinity? It's not infinity plus one, it's just infinity. How can one set be bigger than the other? Ponder that. I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about that later, but there's a way to, to really conceptualize that that'll make sense. But you think about that for now. We'll come back to that. It's just kind of a fun thing to think about. <clears throat> so then something like this, obviously, if x is, is greater than a and b, another way to say that is x is strictly between a and b. That's another mathematical language we might use, terminology we might use. It's not including the endpoints. You know, that's just going to look like this, right? Between a and b. This is probably unnecessary. Greater than, greater than or equal to a and less than b. looks like that, like that, right? Makes sense. And then down here, we're going to have closed endpoints at both ends. Okay, you get the idea. Right? Not a big deal. Okay, so where are we going with this? So we want to do things now, and this is not hard, but we want this is a strong, or an important connection to make. We want to be able to look at a graph, and based on the graph, we want to be able to write the domain and the range. And soon we'll also talk about things like intervals where the function is positive, intervals where it's negative, intervals where it's increasing, intervals where it's decreasing, right? Not difficult stuff, but it plays a huge role in calculus, for example, right? Being able to make this visual connection. So we're going to practice it a little bit. What about this? Find the domain of this function and write it as an inequality. We'll write it both ways. How about? So what do you think? What's that domain? Think about it. You might have some legitimate questions about, well, how do I know? They got a suggestion? What do you think? It's all real numbers. Okay, yeah. all real numbers. So anybody want to debate that? Well, even if you don't think it's, even if you think he's right, can you can you think of a reason that gives you even just a little bit of pause there? The, what, what do you mean by that? Below the, below the function? Yeah. Okay, now, so let, let's dissect the question here. If we're asking about the domain, we're asking about the domain, first of all. Okay, yeah, so answer your own question then, Jenner. What's, what's going on? It's going to go to the left and the right. Okay, good. The domain is the set of all input values, right? So for us, that's going to be x. We've got, we've got the, on this graph, we've got the x-axis and the y-axis. X is going to be the implied input, Y is the implied output. Okay, so it goes to the left forever and the right forever. Maybe, but what's, does anybody still have a question? Anybody thinking, how do you know it goes forever? Right? Okay, there's a great, great way to think about it. What, what, what are you saying, Ty? Let's see. So either way, it might go flat, right? There, there's, there's the issue. Maybe it goes flat somewhere and goes straight up and down. Okay, it's a possibility, right? Uh, but if it did that, so, and that's a great question, how would you know? If it did that, though, on the graph, 
we would have to indicate that in a special way. Does anybody know how we would indicate? For example, let's just say, hypothetically, that as we trace this graph off to the left, it never passed negative 6. Well, that, that would, I mean, we, we could write that domain, but what would the graph have to show us? I mean, maybe you've never seen it. You probably have never seen this before. But have, have you ever seen something? You tell me. Have you ever seen something like this before? Like where we would have something like that? And that's like a wall, right? That's like a wall that's telling us the function can approach that but never quite get to it. That's called a, an asymptote. That would be a vertical asymptote. Uh, well, okay, if it's a function, you you, answer, you guys answer that question. Could it start curving back on itself if it's a function? How come? Okay, I heard about 14 times the vertical line test, right? It's, it can, you can't have a vertical line that's going to ever line up with multiple points. How's it go straight up? Okay, it can't. It can't go straight up. But think about this now. Think about this example. What if I, for the rest of my life, I think maybe I've given you this one before, for the rest of my life, or the rest of the universe, the rest of time, assuming time goes forever, and space is infinitely subdividable, which well, it's not really. We can talk about that later. That's a big business thing. But, uh, but assuming that it is, mathematically it is, so if I were to cut my distance to the door in half every second, right, once a second, so there's one second, there's two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, etc. Do I ever get to the door? No. Okay. Assuming we could subdivide space infinitely, I would never get to the door, right? Do I ever stop moving though? No. no. I'm always moving closer to the door. Is there any point, if I had an infinitely fine sharpie, is there any point that I could draw on the floor, not on the door, on the floor that I wouldn't eventually step on? No, right? Now if you're thinking, yeah, just choose the point right next to the door, right? Does that point exist? No. no. It doesn't. All I have to do is focus in, zoom in, and how many points are between that point and the door? Infinite, right? Does that make sense? So in that way, that's how asymptotic behavior works. This is, let me write this word down. So this is an asymptote. That's a vertical asymptote. Right? We'll, we'll talk a lot more about asymptotes later. But as a function approaches a vertical asymptote, if I were to zoom out then, if this were an asymptote, the function would always get closer and closer and closer to hugging that asymptote. But if I focus in, if I zoom in, I'll see that it's never gotten there, that it's always got a ways to go, just like I'm always getting closer to the door. Right. It could never actually be vertical because then it wouldn't be a function. Exactly. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. And there, we'll deal with lots of functions like this throughout the year. This one, though, it doesn't have a vertical asymptote, and so the assumption is that nah, this thing is just always going to expand. If we go further and further left and further and further right. If I zoom out, I'm always going to see this thing spreading out side to side. Right? And so we would say in this case that because there is no asymptote, the domain is all real numbers. So how do we say that? Domain x such that there's a bunch of ways to say that all real numbers. We could say all reals and abbreviate that. We could say there's a ton of stuff we could say. We could say x is an element of the set of real numbers, which means it could be any real number. But the way we'll say it, if we're using our two, you know, our our, our the, the the two. The, the two means of expressing a domain. We're either going to use interval notation or inequalities. If I write it as an inequality, it would just be x is greater than negative infinity and less than infinity, positive infinity, right? That's weird, but does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that's not very, that's, that's pretty wide open, isn't it? Every number is greater than negative infinity and every number is less than positive infinity. Yeah. Writing that using interval notation just looks like that. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Another one. How about that guy? The domain. There's no vertical dotted lines. In this case, they're just kind of light red lines. But there is no vertical line on this. And so, what is it? All reals. All reals. Same thing. 
What that guy? So let's write this both ways. Let's write this as an inequality. So we're talking it's domain, right? So we're talking x values here. Okay, so let, what's it going to be? X is greater than 3 and less than or equal to 9. Okay, good. If I write that using interval notation, lower boundary, upper boundary, Parentheses, bracket. Yeah, you got it. Pretty obvious, right? Same kind of thing. So using interval notation, what would this be? My lower boundary is negative 8. Upper boundary? Okay, good. You got it. Okay, what about the range? Range? Okay, there's another, there's another question that just comes up. You might be thinking just a little point of uncertainty that we got to make sure you feel like you know the answer for sure. Okay. The range, set of y values, right? Less than. Okay, less than. Or. So y is less than. Okay, almost. What's wrong with that? Equal to. Yeah, it's equal to. And why? Why? Yeah, okay, because there is, there's a point there. Would you agree there's a point there whose coordinates are, I guess we don't really care about the x coordinate, it's 2, but the y coordinate is 4, right? So we need to include that equal to. Okay. So what would that look like using interval notation? So is negative 4 an upper or lower limit? Vertically, right? We're talking about... If we're talking about range, we're talking about y values. So you kind of have to turn your head sideways, at least in, in your mind. Right? Upper boundary. Right? It's an upper boundary. What's the lower boundary? There is none. Right. So negative infinity, upper boundary, bracket. Okay. If we were to, here's another way to kind of visualize this. I know you don't need this. You get this answer, but I want you to think about this in this way because it's going to pay dividends later on when, when you're in calculus or physics class. Uh, when we want to isolate the domain or the range, the, the range is the set of y values. So another way to think about that would be if we were to take the function and squeeze it onto the y-axis, what kind of a smear would it leave on the y-axis? What would it look like? Or if you were to shine lights on this thing horizontally and cast shadows on the y-axis, what would the shadows look like? It'd be a straight line, and it would include that point, right? So that's what, if we squeeze this thing on there, that's what it would look like, and so that's the range. Okay, if we squeeze this thing onto the x-axis, what would it look like? Well, it just flat line. Just look like a line, infinitely long line, right? So the domain would be all reals, okay? about that guy? What's the range? All reals, All reals right? Because yeah. vertically it would be the whole y-axis if I squeeze it onto the y-axis. Okay, take a second. Don't say it out loud. Everybody look at that. Think so the range. Let's write it as maybe an inequality. Madeline, what do you think? I'll start with the y. What's the lower boundary? Negative four. Upper boundary? Ten. What kind of inequalities? Y is. Well, okay, so y would be greater than. Do I need to include it? I do. Good. And y is less than or equal to 10. Good. Let me see that. So if I write that, if I write that using uh, interval notation, I'd have to have solid brackets, negative 4, positive 10. Okay. So if I lose no arrows on the end of that, it's the same as just the whole way. It just goes forever. Yeah. Yeah. This is just some kind of a 
sinusoidal function, sine graph, cosine graph, something like that. It just goes forever. We just took a snapshot of it, though, right? Okay. If I zoomed out, I'd see more. So, last issue then for today. Uh, average rate of change. So, an average rate of change, there's a couple ways you can think about this. We're going to come back to this concept again and again. For today, we're just going to define it this way. An average rate of change is always defined as the change in the output over the change in the input, right? So another way of saying that would be output is y, if we're talking about, you know, graphs, for example, in the xy plane. So delta y over delta x, what does delta mean again? Change in. So change in y over change in x. That looks an awful lot like what? Looks an awful lot like slope, doesn't it? Right? Looks an awful lot like slope. So average rate of change we can think of as just, it literally, graphically, is the slope between the, the two points, right? The points that define the interval. Let's look at an example or two. So what if we've got something like this? Uh, you know what? Let me go back this. Try that. So we want to know what's the average rate of change in gasoline price from 2005 to 2012. So they're giving us some table with some information here, right? We know average cost in dollars <clears throat> of a gallon of gas for the years 2005 to 2012 is given right here. It's presumably just around the country. If you average all the prices, this is what you get. So if we want to find the average rate of change in gasoline price from 05 to 12, what do we do? So 3.68 minus 2.31, those are the outputs, right? So we want the change in output value. Ch a change in a value is always going to be the final value minus the initial value, right? So in this case, we end up with a bigger final value than initial value. So is the change positive or negative? Positive. What if the prices had dropped, and this was like a buck fifty or something? Then we would have had 1.5 minus 2.31, which would have given us a negative value, which makes sense, right? Because the change in the output was negative; it went down, right? Divided by 12, yeah, 2012 minus 2005, which is just seven, right? So that's no big deal. If we do that math, we get about that. So an average rate of change was a just just shy of twenty cents per dollar, right? Or per gallon. Per year. Per year. Yeah, per year. There we go. Dollars per year. Okay. Okay. How about this? Average rate of change over the interval, where x goes from negative seven to positive seven. Okay. Well, let's let's look at that interval. If I'm starting at negative seven. There's the point that has an x-coordinate of negative 7. Here's the point that has an x-coordinate of positive 7, right? What's the output at negative 7? 2. What's the output at positive 7? Okay, so we can do that math. So the average rate of change is just going to be what minus what? Negative 2 minus 2, right? Final value minus initial value divided by 7 minus negative 7. So what's that give us? Negative 4 divided by 14. Negative 4 over 14, which reduces to? Okay, watch this. If I were to graph a line, Connecting those two points, and I made a slope triangle out of that. Of course, what are we going to find? If I go down, if I go down by negative four, I'm going to run by positive fourteen, and so that's just 
That's just defining the slope between those two lines. In math, we give that, not that this is important for now, but we'll talk about this a lot in calculus. When we talk about the, a line that's connecting two points, and it might intersect the graph in other places, but if, we, if we're talking about a line that specifically connects uh, two points on a graph, we call that a secant line. Just file that away for later. Okay, what about this one? Real quick, we can just look at the graph. If we're going from 0, x equals 0, up to x equals 6, what's the average rate of change? Zero. zero. The slope is 0. It's a flat line, right? Okay, we got it.